Um, how's the frogs doing? They're great. Um, it's it's really funny how I can't really talk about it very much here. Because, <laughs> I don't know, it's not taken super seriously, but when we're out there, I mean, band director, we're, we're like the band director's dream. Sure, sure. Not quite to the extent that a, um, there's this other group out of Ann Arbor that's a reed quintet. Uh huh. And that's, I mean, yeah. you're basically their entire woodland section. Yeah, right, 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 right. And so that's, so that's love great. It. But, you know, we're talking, uh, we're talking about management. I'll be out of the screen, so if you need mm -hmm. to grab it and take a sip, oh, great. that would be great. But, now, did you, uh, did you switch to Yamaha? Yeah, on a couple of my horns. I was, uh... <laughs> Are you searching? I'm, well, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. A little bit. I only, I only say that because of what you said in uh, the Q&A. Um, with Ron, you know? Right. Right. I'm trying to find yourself. Well, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's probably the, the, uh... The quest of a lifetime is to find your individual voice. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's hard. It's hard with the uh, with the internet, of which I'm a part now. Hi, yeah. internet. Hi, internet. Um, <laughs> to uh, you know, it, there tends to be these these sort of pillars that rise, and then everybody clamors to sound like right. these three to right. four or five saxophonists, mm -hmm. and then, which is good. All the saxophonists are starting to behave more. People right. are playing better, but mm -hmm. it's also kind of stifling. As somebody, you know, my age, who's trying to, whatever, yeah. set the world on fire. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you like it? You like, you like the uh, alto? Do I like playing alto? No, no. Oh, oh, oh the, yeah, I'm playing a custom Z. Yeah, I find it's uh, Yamaha. I find that it's... Uh... Oh, this is not going to be I'm just, uh, don't Where's put this on here. I'm not trying to... Uh... We are a con seller. <laughs> we get no support from Yamaha, this I might add. This is a con seller camp. Yeah. No, so... Or, or seller Paris. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was spurred by a video by Yvonne Roth. And he was talking about how he missed his Mark VI. Yeah. And so he, he uh, you know, went through all the new commercial horns and really liked the Custom Z because it... Uh, sounded like his Mark VI, oh. and so I was like, okay, I'll do that, because I was interested in, you know, old Mule, Mule and uh, Defaye, even though he plays a buffet sometimes, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and, uh, I, and, and I'm playing jazz, that's like the, my dirty little secret, mm -hmm. is I'm playing about half and half at home, Yeah. and so, um, classical is kind of... Tanking. Were you on a series three or series two? Between? Just a two. Yeah, no, the two works great for jazz, though. It's true. No, it's a great horn. Yeah. It was a great horn, but I'd also been playing it for twenty years. Yeah, yeah. And so I just thought, let's just pull the rug from out. Yeah, uh, what is it? You burn the ships and then right. you storm the island. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I you know speaking, of, you know, twenty year old horn. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, Valentine. On, Valentine wants to buy my. My other horn. Really? I mean, like she really, really wants to buy. I mean, she's like that's great. Three times, but you know, it's one. Of, it's a horn that I've had for twenty years, uh, since ninety one. Is that twenty years or thirty already? Um, <laughs> and, you know what I mean? And it's a yeah. fantastic horn. And I'm, uh, you know, I, um, uh, I, I love that horn. And so I, I just, I don't know. I don't know why I'm specifically attached to that horn, um, but. And I also like the the idea of having two altos. Yeah. Um, but why do I need two altos? Right. <laughs> but it's such a What's great your other one. Is it? I, I um, well, so is it a series two? Uh, yeah. So um, no, it's a series two. Okay. Two. Three. So okay. when I right before I went to Strasbourg, mm -hmm. my octave key mechanisms were not uh, working. Like I would go from uh, uh, example A to F, mm -hmm. and the G would slug down, uh, you know, right? right? And um, mm -hmm. if I would go high note, everything was fine in the high notes in the neck, but it, it was clearly the first octave key right. mechanism. And so I had the repairman here fix it, and it was good for about 30 seconds, and now it, it's I'm flying to Strasbourg. So I called uh, uh, DP and learned that uh, 
uh, Vincent was coming down from the factory uh, for Selma, you know, and all the tools with it. Yeah. And so literally I got off the plane, uh, to, it took the train from Frankfurt, arrived in Strasbourg, don't even check into the hotel. I'm dragging my luggage and my horn directly to Vincent, and I tell him the story, and he and he's looking at me like, like I'm like dumb. I mean, just dumb. He goes, "I've never heard of this. This is impossible." <laughs> and I went, and he's saying it to everybody in French, and I'm picking up just enough. <laughs> but he's talking, you know, dumb, uh, you know, getting insulted, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and so um, I, I, you know, I'm just kind of, and he's the sweetest guy. I mean, he's just so wonderful. And it's like 4.30, like they're only going to be open for another half hour. And so he's drilling, boring out the the uh, uh, the rods. Mm. He's like, he, and, he, and he's looking at it first, but he goes, oh my God, I've never seen anything like this in my entire <laughs> life. I mean, it's like the craziest thing. And uh, so anyway, short of the story is um, he fixed it long enough for it to hold for the performance. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I came back and I put an uh, insurance claim last year mm -hmm. and all that dramatic stuff. So I, I, I received a, 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 an insurance claim on it. Wow. And it was dramatic because I had a state farm policy uh -huh. and I've been paying on a rider for uh, 19 years. Uh -huh. And then they say, oh, you're a professional musician. Yeah. We, we can't cover this. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so that was half the summer. Okay. So anyway, right. Then they covered it and... Um, I was able to find uh, uh, assistance, and um, so it was, well, you, you're not, you do not put this on. Okay. <laughs> this episode brought this to you by, by Selma Paris. <laughs> and so, so it, it um, works beautifully. Yeah. Great. But I didn't, that, I didn't have it back until like, this, like oh, December. Oh, so in the meantime, you had a jubilee. I went out to the factory and picked out a new, uh, new horn. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then the other thing is, I found because my 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 custom Z was like perfectly um, sealing and yep. was working. Yes, right. I think I think not that my my series two may have not been as in as perfect mechanical shape. So when you went one from the other, it just felt like butter. Yeah, yeah. So happened? maybe that was that informed my decision too. But I do feel the flexibility, and also maybe Valentine, you have metal resonators in there. You have root pads, yeah, right? Yeah, in, in that yeah, horn. Yeah. And yeah. so, I mean, these things make a difference. They make a huge difference. So, anyway. so I'm like, I'm asking her, so, you know, if I do it, which I just, everybody says you're crazy if you do it. Uh, not everybody. Fred says I should do it. What do you need two horns for? John says I should do it. What do you yeah, need two horns for? Two right? horns, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, and Josh is like, are you crazy? That's the best one ever. <laughs> it's like, and so it's I fun. don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. I told her I would tell her tomorrow. But... Oh my goodness, the Jubilee. Have you tried it? Have you tried the Jubilee? Oh, they're, I mean, they're great. Yeah. They're yeah, great. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, uh, um, it's very different than the, uh, the older twos. Uh, mm -hmm. There's just much more mm, to it. It's been, um, it's, t it's taken me a while to get used to it, actually. A little bit of the C Virgil? Is that gone now? The what? The C Virgil middle C? No, no, no. It's the... Um, it's I, I, The only way to describe it, it's it's like a turbo. I mean, <laughs> it's like it's like all the... It just has such um, um, power to it. And I, I've had to learn to... Like, I, I don't have to work so hard. So, like, right. you know, you know, like when we're listening to kids and they're just blasting the high notes and stuff yeah. like that? Um, I've, I've had... I've had to learn to, I don't have to work uh, yeah. up there, you know? Rain is in. I don't know. How did it sound? I mean, I'm not fishing for com uh, comments, uh, you know, but uh, yeah, I wasn't, um, I should have wet my reed before I went up. It sounded great in the middle. We all, yeah, but, we but, all were struggling. We were struggling. We were struggling. We were struggling. We were struggling. God. Uh, but does it sound okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So. Maybe maybe the wrong read and wrong mouthpiece. This episode brought to you by right. Dario. <laughs> <laughs> no, Van no. Doren. <laughs> what can I say? Van Doren, no, I love I mean, have you tried the eight twenty? I have. No, I've played that mouthpiece. It's it's lovely. Well no, I no, I'm I'm on an AL three and uh -huh. um they just sent me the eight twenty and the thing that's weird about the eight twenty is it literally feels like a you're playing lead alto here, uh, right? It ha for me it's just very bright and yeah. and uh, it's it's the weirdest sensation, but out in front, it is 
incredibly warm. Yeah. And um, uh, I just don't trust, you know, when it would be an interesting concept if I was um, soloing with an ensemble mm -hmm. like I, I'm doing in the, in the spring. Um, what are you playing in the spring? Um, I'm with, just with, with our bands um, doing, have you heard the uh, n this new arrangement of the uh, Machinsky for Chamberlain? The Sonata? Yeah. Ah, okay. So I'm doing that with the Wind Ensemble. Great. And then I'm doing, uh, this is what's scheduled right now, um, Concerto um, of Michael Ball. Mm -hmm. uh, have you heard that? I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. It's, uh, it, it's actually from 90, I want to say 99, 98. Um, lovely little piece. You know, lovely little piece. Not, uh, very bandy. Yeah. But, but I've, I've done the Fantasia and I've done all that stuff. And I just, you know, it's lovely. Time but, for something new. But it's time for something new. Absolutely. So I wanted to, you know, sir. And, and um, our band could not handle Husa. <laughs> our band could not, you know, so not doll the symphonic. They couldn't yeah. handle a doll. I mean, it, that's just a little bit. It would take all year for our band to do. So you're able to experiment with all your different Van Doren setups. And well, I never have. I mean, here's the, that's why I was asking you the question about Matthews because I went to that stage, um, you know, early in my career um, of you know switching mouthpieces and reeds, and mm -hmm. I had you know had a collection bar none, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and then way. you know when I found my sound. Mm -hmm. um, I went, well, I'm not change, ever changing this ever again kind right. of thing because it's not worth, what I have found, it's not worth the search. Right. You know, that, you know, your sound, ultimately, I think your sound is going to be what your sound is. Right. Right. And I'd rather go practice. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, right. not a instead reference of, to you. Instead, instead I, of yes. switching. But everybody has to go through that. I yeah. mean, if you haven't done it before, everybody has to go through it. Several times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, I, I don't have the time. You Absolutely. Know? And so, uh, <laughs> Leo, you know, was asking me, you know, how much do you practice? You know, and I'm thankful if I get 20 minutes of long tones a day, you know, yeah. you know, just to keep the horn in, in my mouth, you know? Um, so... Right. I don't I have to close this because it's bleeding in. But that's an interesting point because you're, I mean, so much of what you do now is administration at Snow Pond, at yes. uh, New England Music Camp, yeah. at Susquehanna. Right. Well, and... I don't do any administration. I mean, I, I at Susquehanna, I don't do anything. Okay. Um, and I really don't do anything with um, NENC. I mean, it's the administrative component is really this. Okay. During the year, and it's really not, you know, during the year, it, it maybe it's anywhere from four to twelve hours a month. You know, it just depends on, right. you know, uh, if my focus is on trying to get uh, participants for uh, Sachs Institute, mm -hmm. um, or I'm doing marketing for, you know, other stuff. So it's not really terrible. Um, it's just that the days are filled at SU. Right, and but, so between classes and lessons and stuff. We'll probably pick it up from when we started talking about your Van Doren setup, yeah, and then yeah. go into this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But but that's yeah. interesting. Is that for a two week camp, every month you put in about four to twelve hours, yeah. emailing, right. and yeah. could you describe that and maybe talk a little bit about Snow Pond and the Frederick L. Hemke Saxophone Institute? Sure. Um, Snow Pond Music Festival started um, six years ago. Um, when the directors of New England Music Camp, mm -hmm. which is a family-owned camp, when the sort of next generation took over, um, at which uh, is John and Kim Wigan, and uh, when they took over from their parents, uh, the Wiggins, uh, uh, John felt that this incredible place needed to be used differently. Mm -hmm. um, and, and more than just uh, six weeks out of the summer. Um, originally, the camp was an eight-week camp, mm -hmm. and you know, with time and stuff, it is like many camps um, is now six weeks. And so that's uh, a lot of days where the property is just sitting, and it's right. just uh, such a great place. And so now, um, you know, we have all these these different components, including the festival. So the festival started out, uh, originally uh, there was uh, conducting and there was the, the chamber music, which still exists today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think a, a first generation percussion uh, seminar. 
And as you know, through time, we found out what what works and what doesn't. Uh, the, the Chamber Music Institute uh, is is fantastic, mm -hmm. and uh, the following year, I approached uh, Fred to see if he. And it was just shortly after his retirement, if he would be interested in doing something during the summer. Yeah. And I think it was great timing right. uh, for him, and it's been just such a you know an incredible success. Two thousand twelve. I think that's right. Yeah, 2012. So this right. is our fifth year doing fifth year. the Frederick L. Hemke Saxophone yeah. Institute. Yeah. And uh, every year it's been, <laughs> it's been a wild ride. It's been a while, and we we went from 12 the first year, mm -hmm. and there was such interest that we've expanded to 20. Right. Um, we've had students from as far away as Australia. Right. And uh, Japan. Uh, Japan. Notably. Notably. Um, many, many students of Masato Komoi. Mm -hmm. And uh, this year we had a student from uh, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So it's been really wonderful international. Uh, Britain. We've had uh, right. breakfast before. Um, and uh, many students from coast to coast uh, in the United States. Norway. Do you remember Hovard? And Hobart, yeah, Hobart, no way. We had Hobart. That's right. <laughs> um, so it's it's just been a, a you know an incredible opportunity for the students, and you know we use the phrase continuing the legacy, um, uh, but I think it even goes beyond that. Yeah. Um, it's a fantastic uh, experience for all of us um, to see the the new generation as such. Yeah, uh, we're in good hands. Right. And right. Uh, right, a lot of good players. A lot yeah. of good players, and uh, you know, just um, uh, and it's and it's great for uh, Dr. Hemke. You know, he's um, his passion about teaching. Right. You know, and for those listening, this is the only two weeks a year, unless you catch him in master class, where you're gonna get those really concentrated. Uh, Hemke principles and lessons that he doesn't teach anywhere else right. now. That's correct. That's correct. And and the format is fantastic because um, each of the faculty, which this year is uh, obviously Dr. Hemke and John Sampin, uh, Sean and myself, we each have our our shtick, if you will, our, our concentration. And, and I think uh, time and time again, what the students say is that's what they love about it mm. it's it's uh, all the same in that it's uh, sort of the, the, the pedagogical philosophy of Dr. Hemke but we all have our lens right. and uh, I think uh, because of that um, the progress they make in two weeks is phenomenal right and we should mention also the first saxophone performance podcast featured Marcus Weiss who was a guest this year? Mm -hmm. I'd love to have him back. Oh. I think he's amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, amazing. Of course, all of you guys are yeah. as well. But yeah. that was so yeah. much fun to get to know him. And and we try uh, each year, you know, to do something different. Right. Uh, several years ago, we had the entire Masato Kumoi uh, Quartet, which was all was four good. members oh. of the Masato Kumoi Quartet yeah. were were staying here for and one week, concert, right? right? For one week, and then Masato stayed. The second week as well. Right. So. Oh yeah, that was right? amazing. Wasn't that amazing? That was amazing. I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and, and again, to reiterate your point, what's great about the four teachers, the core teachers, is that there's that thread of Dr. Hemke's philosophy and pedagogy going through all of us. So you're not getting too divergent uh, teaching philosophy from each teacher. Right. It's all kind of, I don't know, builds up the man, Dr. Hemke's uh, uh, teaching. And, oh. and for students to go to their lesson with him, right, right where they put their, whatever repertoire they are preparing for him and put it together with piano. Right. So in many ways, our role is to prepare them for that experience to get the utmost right. out of that experience. We should also mention Sharon Peterson yes. is the staff uh, collaborative artist, also a faculty member here. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when you play your lesson with Dr. Hemke, you get to play the piano. And it's, I mean, where else do you get that? Right. But so I, I'd like to talk because you're, we got on the topic of pedagogy and you literally wrote the book on pedagogy. And but before we get to that, before we get to the dissertation, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, I want I want to get back. I want to go back to um, 
gosh, there was a there was a time when maybe you were between degrees, and this was before the doctorate at Northwestern, but you were teaching in Texas. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. set that up a little bit, like uh -huh. how you got there, and then sure. what spurred you to well, go I did to my, Yeah, I did my undergraduate at Butler University, um, which was uh, um, is a fine institution, yeah. and, and much of which I loved about it. Um, but as an as an undergrad, um, it was just a unique time in in that uh, moment. Um, in that, uh, due to circumstances that everybody's con out of everybody's control, I had four teachers in four years, oh my um, which is uh, not the greatest way um, to um, establish a personal performance identity. I mean, mm. all four had very di different. Focuses, um, all four came from very unique backgrounds, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, from one who was uh, uh, sort of a protege. Of, I, I think that's not too strong a word of uh, C Cecil uh, Leeson oh. um, to um, uh, a Dr. Rousseau student uh, to. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what John's background was, um, uh, but mostly jazz, yeah. and um, uh, you know, so it it was just all different personalities, all different experiences, and and so from that, what was really great is I learned uh, as a music educator what I didn't want to be. <laughs> I was always really passionate about woodwinds. Um, uh, I was all also very fortunate uh, at Butler at the time. Um, uh, Rosemary Lang was a member of the faculty. I, I did not study saxophone with her, but she was the woodwind person, uh, woodwind class person. This is at Butler? At Butler, okay. yeah. Okay, wow. And so she, um, uh, many years after um, my experiences with her, what I learned was that she was really a woman a ahead of her time. Mm. Um, there was, uh, you know, sort of old school. Um, and so I learned... In the grand scheme of things, I learned much from her. But what I really took away from as a saxophonist is, is and uh, is that as I didn't want, what I didn't want to be as a teacher, and I knew that I wanted to focus in on studio and apply. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, beginning of my junior year, my parents moved to Texas, and uh, uh, Love Indianapolis for those who are from Indianapolis, but it was a very different place back then. <laughs> and uh, the, 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 uh, I really loved Dallas, and so I, I moved to to Dallas, and uh, uh, I didn't know what I really wanted to do other than I wanted to teach uh, mm -hmm. and play saxophone. And uh, so I thought, well, if I can, you know, I was living at home. 21 years old, and yeah. I figured if I could get a couple students a week, you know, and I would build. Well, Texas is an incredible place uh, for applied study in the schools, and I was very fortunate. Um, in I, I found a little home in, in Garland, Texas, which is right outside of Dallas, and uh, um, had nine students at the end of uh, December, mm -hmm. at the end of the first semester. And the, at the end of the year, I had 30 students. Mm. And at the end of the next year, I had like 60 students. And I, after six years, I had built up a studio of 104. Oh. And I was, teaching, uh, I was teaching, without exaggeration, 12 hours a day, except for Fridays. And I was so proud that I got out at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> and then I would go gig at night and do musical theater and, and oh stuff like that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So what I what was fantastic about that experience, um, every child learns differently, uh. and uh, you know the students came in for thirty minute lessons, uh, uh, and I would start before school and end school, and it was just a fantastic experience. Uh, I I loved it. I. I couldn't earn a living. I mean, it was like back then. It was much more difficult. Yeah. Um. You know, for a half hour lesson, I think I started at like four dollars a half hour. No. Something. Yeah. Oh, no. And so, and so one, so one July, um, I was teaching in the summer, and uh, anybody who has uh, uh, lived the life of a self-employed musician mm -hmm. uh, understands. You know, you're at the mercy of people paying you, mm -hmm. and uh, I was teaching in July, and I. 
literally said, I can't do this anymore. Right. And I think I'm going to grad school. (laughs) (laughs) And I literally, I call it my sabbatical from life. And I literally uh, decided um, uh, to go back to uh, Indianapolis because I heard that Bill Hockheppel was now the saxophone teacher at Butler. And I didn't know Bill. Uh, the only thing I knew about uh, Bill was that he was a student of Dr. Nefke's. And uh, I had made the decision in part because of a dear friend who also lived in, in Dallas, who had just graduated from Northwestern with his master's. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Scott Pluggy. Um, that, uh, you know, that Northwestern was the place to be and life mm-hmm. was good. So it was literally a roll of the dice for me. It was a take a break and go back to Dallas or um, I used a year and it was Northwestern or nothing. And so uh, luckily at the end of that year after studying with Bill and stuff, um, it was Northwestern. So that following year I I moved to Evanston. That's great. I want to talk briefly about the teaching because you know, nowadays you can actually charge a pretty decent rate. And if you had 104 students, yeah, yeah, so it's just different, different times. Yeah. And so, well, ironically, <laughs> yeah. ironically, um, uh, at the end of the year uh, of teaching 104 students, we got a raise. Oh. So I did all the calculations, you know, and I basically said, I can go down to 70. You know, I can go down to 80, whatever it was. Right, but I, right. but I, you know, I got, you know. To make a decent yeah, salary, yeah, a decent wage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it was killing me. I mean, when you're 20, you can do lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> when you're in 20s, you can do you lots can, of you things, right? You can eat right? beans and rice. Right, and, right, uh, right. And, uh, teach 104 students. Right, and you know, I was able to get an apartment, you know, right. move out of the hat, you know, all that good stuff. Right. Yeah, but <laughs> definitely definitely a, a very uh, circuitous path totally. to, get, to get to Dr. Hemke. Totally. A lot of different teachers in your undergrad. And then um, we will get into, you did a master's and then went into the doctorate with Dr. Uh, Hemke? Master's and then I uh, stayed for the uh, certificate, the artist diploma. Artist diploma. And, and, and I think then I decided, okay, that was two years. Mm-hmm. I needed, and I had, had applied for the uh, doctorate and, and did get in. Um, but, I, but I thought, you know, I should take a year. Mm-hmm. You know, and be ready because I knew the doctorate was going to be a, a long haul. Yeah. And I was very committed to uh, what I, find, I fondly call uh, the ten-year plan. I was not going to do that. It was do it, and you know, I, you know, yeah. you know uh, at some close. point, I got close to the seven-year plan. Right. Yeah. Right. At some point, you have to say, I have, to, you know, I have to go out and earn a living. You know. Right. And, right? Yeah. 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 And so uh, I took a year off and came back and and taught. Um, a little bit of garland, I did, you know, just uh, just enough to um, have, you know, take some money in my pocket. Yeah, right. take have some money in my pocket and stuff. Right. And then I came back up. Okay, okay. And so, out of sort of the chaos of your undergrad, and then basically, um, there's this term in uh, pop psychology. You know, you put in your ten thousand hours basically yes. Yes. teaching a hundred and four yeah. students. Yeah, yeah. And it just seemed like. Um, like you were ready to go to, to kind of um, put together your teaching philosophy. And so you undertook this huge project. And I'm sure Dr. Hemke was really putting it on you to... to... It actually... Uh, um, he loved the idea. Yeah. Um, and could you explain what the, what the paper, the topic for the I, listeners? Um, because of my interest in, in applied studies... In between, uh, really in, in the middle of my first year of doctoral studies, mm-hmm. um, I came across uh, an older method in the library. And I went, interesting. Mm-hmm. And I just looked at it and I went, interesting. So I went to him and I said, I think I have an idea for my topic. I would like to collect methods from all over the world and see if the if you know what the pedagogy says, if it's aligned, what the history says, mm-hmm. um, and that summer, in between my first and second year of coursework, um, was the uh, World Congress in Pesaro. So um, I was already going over with uh, the quartet that I was in, uh, Vision, 
and vision I, quartet. Vision quartet. And mm. uh, I decided that I would extend my time in Europe, and I went to the Bibliothèque Nationale, and uh, you know went through different places, and uh, uh, used that time you know to start research, but. I hadn't even done a proposal yet. Yeah. I just presented him with the idea right. and, and kind of said, but if I do this, we're locking this in, <laughs> right? So, and he said yes. So he was, he was very, very supportive. And nobody had done it, obviously. So right. it, it was a great topic choice. Of course. And then could you describe maybe the process of doing the paper? Uh, I talked to Dr. Henke about this too. Really, really? Yeah. Um, the, the the paper or the the collection of the collection, the collection. research, writing, life balance during all of that. <laughs> if yeah. you had any. Well, uh, while I was in coursework, I was actually using a lot of that time to uh, do the research and put the proposal together and stuff. So. Um, I, I went to the Bibliothèque Nationale, which was just a, a gold find uh, of material. And, and the best part of that is, um, for those of you watching in internet land, there used to be, when you went to the library, a card file system <laughs> and no computers. And you would go through and you would look up uh, 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 composers, authors, you know, authors, um, or, or subject matter. Uh -huh. So I was looking up... Uh, you know, uh, I, I knew Kastner had written an mm. early method. I'd look up Kastner, um, I'd look up saxophone instruction, you mm. know, and I came across uh, this uh, unbelievable find that I, that was probably like a ghost writer, in fact, but we, we're not totally sure. Um, uh, so there was three methods collected, uh, written in 1846, mm. one of which we had no idea. So that was a, a lovely find. And then um, I spent time at all the major libraries, the Library of Congress, um, Philadelphia, uh, New York Public, uh, Boston, wow. uh, Chicago. Um, and at that point, uh, internet was just starting to right. you know, come to the surface. And so I was, a, uh, I was able to do a, a much of my research um, beyond those institutions online. Uh, you know, the web was just starting to provide some basic card catalogs. Um, the word was already out, so people um, who had come to NU, uh, saxophonists who come to uni from uh, Europe, um, they'd find something and they would send it to me. Oh. But, um, uh, so at the time of my proposal, um, I had collected like a hundred methods, but at the end of the process I collect I had collected like 300 methods from all over the world wow and are you still finding new ones now? Every, once in a while my, my <laughs> what's interesting is eBay is a great place oh my gosh <laughs> um, yeah you can people you know are trying to get feel like a, maybe like a lot of stuff from that sax craze era yeah know, exactly like, I mean really uh, yeah. uh, amazing finds oh, amazing that's finds cool. and including in uh, uh, Dr. Hempke's own uh, library at the time yeah. Um, several, um, uh, you know, for five cents, and um, but all related to the saxophone craze. And interestingly enough, uh, you know, we we look at where we are today, um, both as uh, you know being able to balance both jazz and classical, mm. um, being uh, contemporary techniques, and right. and we th and I always chuckle with contemporary techniques because. We, we think that, that there's something new. Mm. But in fact, uh, these effects, as, if you will, were uh, uh, the technique of the day in the 20s because right. there were no uh, you know, computers to generate sound or you know, <laughs> there, uh, vaudeville was the entertainment of, of the day, right? right? So you would have methods that would talk about multiphonics, that would talk about slap tongue, that would talk about um, uh, uh, um, uh, growling, I mean, a whole list wow. of quarter tone, I mean, um, <laughs> and they, everything from, uh, you know, the obvious, like they would call multiphonics chords. Right. And uh, then they would have great things like the barking dog, 
you know, I mean, all kinds of really, really interesting That's things. That's hilarious. Yeah. With and without mouthpiece, you know. Oh, and, my God. You know, <laughs> it almost reads like a like the Londex Hello, Mr. Sachs. It's the Hello, it's a Hello Mr. Sachs of uh, the 1920s. Really, what? really interesting. That's great. Okay. But I, I think I think this, this point about, because we didn't even get into the writing, I think I, I think this point about the dissertation and, and Dr. Hemke's insistence that we write dissertations, it seems like all the saxophones that come through, they sort of, they write almost their thesis on on life, and then they kind of live that theme yeah, yeah. once they leave school. So mm-hmm. for me, it was um, battling with the genre and talking about techniques of, in this case, Baroque, but I know in my own life, it's it's how do I create a jazz sound? A classical sound. What's the uh, associated techniques and equipment that go with that, and yeah. that that sort of thing. Yeah. And then for you, you know, digging digging all the way back to Kastner, and then yeah. and then um, actually going through history, and then to the present day, republishing Rosemary Lang's method book, which I'd like to talk about. Yeah. But but just that you have this this grasp of teaching and pedagogy and the history and that um, you you live that you live that I, 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 I hope I do and I, <laughs> I, I you know and I think um, and I hope I, I balance it um, you know well with with performing you know mm-hmm. I mean I wish I could perform much more to a greater level than I do mm, but um, I think right um, yeah. <laughs> but but I, I think if if that's my Sort of my my flag is understanding the the how to teach and and what um, what are um, not only what Dr. Henke taught, which is obviously incredible, right. um, but there's so much to glean from from previous methods that um, that I love using. You know, I, I passionately love using. And you know even the simplest things in in the, in the translations. Um, um, I know you've heard me talk about this, uh, and I think it's just very very interesting. Um, you know, for uh, for the American methods, we very readily see the syllable two. You know, as T O O for tongue position and and, and tonguing. Um, and uh, one of the th- the uh, methods that I found. Um, that was translated from the French and uh, was brought uh, to America via a, a British uh, uh, author, which was very interesting to me because he was like, the French use TU, right, to describe mm-hmm. uh, what the, and we pronounce it as TU in America, that's what came over. But he was like, no, 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 it's T, like <laughs> Turkey, right? Okay. And, right? And, and, and I, when I read that, you know, I went, Wait, you know, because it completely changes everything. To you know, two is very, very flat. But when you say to, your tip is down ever so slightly. Uh, and uh, mm-hmm. so it's the stuff like that. It's you know uh, the research. What I loved about the process um, are were the nuggets, mm. right? Yeah. You know, and uh, uh, yeah. I absolutely adored the research, uh, the dissertation, the writing of it, the research of it, um, and uh, y- yes, you had a very large document uh, at the end of the process. You can go um, ahead and tell how how, how big it was. Um, <laughs> it's a very um, big paper. With, it's, it, with with uh, I haven't looked at it in a while. With, with annotations. Yeah. Um, it was over 300 pages, I think. It's a hefty document. It's, uh, yeah, it was over a pound. Yeah, definitely <laughs> twice as heavy as mine, but... <laughs> really? Did yeah. you get away with yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a different time, <laughs> I think. But, but hopefully through the blog and through all of this stuff, I'm making up for it. Um, yeah, no, totally. <laughs> and it's a great project. So you're okay. <laughs> good, good. I get approval. That's nice. Um... <laughs> But yeah, so you you mentioned how influential Rosemary Lang was back at Butler. This was back at Butler. And then how did you, of course, through combing through all of her methods, or through all of the methods for saxophone, you must have run into uh, 
Rosemary Lang's is this autismo study? Yeah, it's beginning sort of, autismo study. Beginning autismo study. Well, and we knew about it. We knew about this method uh, as undergrads. Um, she published um, several documents uh, in addition to the autismo. Her Woodwind method text mm -hmm. was a uh, uh, was one of two really. Uh, well-known woodwind method books oh. um, available in the uh, in the mid. I mean, it was like the West Paul and the Rosemary Lane. The interesting part of uh, of her uh, publications is that everything was self-published in her basement, mm -hmm. and that was key, was key to to the uh, experience. And um, so when I was back at Butler for that uh, uh, year of uh, my life sabbatical. Uh, uh, I connected uh, with her. Well, um, actually, I somebody gave me like all her um, mimeograph. Um, you know, her writing. It was, it was all stored because she had, uh -huh. had already passed away. It was very interesting, and so I didn't think anything of it. I mean, uh, the re the reality of, with this this little project is um, I was at a NASA con convention and. Um, uh, Steve Mock, sorry, I had a finger. Uh, Steve Mock from Ithaca knew that I had uh, graduated from Butler, right. and he asked me um, to pursue the the, the project. Um, that at that point now, because Rosemary's uh, uh, methods were self-published right. after she passed, um, once the stock was gone, right. you know, it was no longer available. Now it's an eBay collectible. <laughs> it's an eBay collectible. Or you find it in your university library That's like right. I did. Yeah. That's right. And I, and I still have my original copy, too. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it was no longer available. So um, uh, a very, very uh, large number of uh, saxophone teachers actually still use it. And so it's becoming mm -hmm. um, harder and harder to find. So Steve asked me about pursuing... Um, this is a project and it was a very very nice gesture because Steve is an uh, amazing saxophonist and pedagogue in his own right he could right. have done it all on his own but it was very generous of him to ask me to do it so I started pursuing it mm -hmm. I started pursuing it and uh, uh, I uh, she had three sisters she was uh, there was no family uh, involved and um, of the, three, the uh, or there was three sisters in the family of her other two sisters only one was still um, alive and through uh, a friend uh, at Butler I was able to reach out to her and the show of the story is that she gave me permission to do a new publication and um, and so I did. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I never, my motivation was only to bring it back mm -hmm. and then all the royalties that we get go back to the scholarship fund in her name. So, um, you know, if you buy that book, just know you're helping somebody. <laughs> right, right. No, and it's interesting because I didn't know much about Rosemary Lang except her book that she came from Woodwind Methods mm -hmm. at Butler mm -hmm. and then... I don't know why. Why would did she even put this together? No, because she. My understanding is is that she studied with Dafayet for a little bit. Okay. Um. Uh. She, somehow there was a connection. I think um, there may have been a connection with uh, Teal. Okay. Um. There was a little bit of autismal the, influence there. A little bit. Okay. And uh, uh, so, yeah. She, uh, she pursued that, and she had a couple clarinet things and a couple flute things, and so it wasn't a foreign concept to her. Right. Um, right. But nobody had of done course. it. Of nobody course. had really done it. Um, 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 I think Dr. Rousseau's came after, right. um, and maybe Ted. I, um, I, I feel like uh, Ted Nash's were contemporaries. Yes, they're close. Close, but hers was the only. Um, method that actually took it from the you know nothing right right you, you know nothing and um, here's how we're gonna get you started can you recall any of the advice in the book it's been a long time since I've read it yeah. about how to yeah. produce Altismo and, uh, she and definitely first used, she definitely used overtones overtones right? right and in the in the new edition um, 
I, um, I, I just present because I try to take it to a point of um, bringing the method up to date. Mm -hmm. So I took out songs that I didn't think were politically appropriate. <laughs> You know, I mean, it was 2000 and something. You know? I'm gonna have you know? to go comb through it now yeah. and see. Well, I mean, you know, I didn't, you know, things like, uh, uh, you know, Swanee and right. you know, things course. like that. I, that, that I just think. And, um, uh, but I tried to present it that there were um, uh, a, a, num a number of different ways right. to approach it. I didn't take out the overtones, I, I kept the truth of, of, of her, but I, I did feel that. Like, I, I wanted to show that there are, were many ways, mm -hmm. you know, to approach it. Um, and the other thing that um, that I did, uh, Rosemary put everything. The basis of the of the book um, is hearing it first. Mm -hmm. It is pitch matching. Right. And so she wrote everything on staff with an ABA, mm -hmm. and um, I felt it was important that. And I've gotten feedback both ways, right. um, but I feel like it's important that we also read ledger lines. I see. And uh, you know, flute players uh, don't get ABAs; right. they read ledger lines. And so I I balanced things out with uh, including some uh, you know at least one or two exercises on every uh, key uh, or note um, with ledger lines. Right. And. Maybe just describe, because this is this is a timeless book, and there, mm -hmm. I, t there's a very specific reason why I think it, you know, um, saxophonists in 2050 are going to be toiling and trying to make these these simple exercises in mm -hmm. the book sound yeah. good. Could you right. maybe describe how the book is formatted? And... Um, once um, the introductory information using the front E and the F right. um, are introduced, she starts on. Uh, uh, F and goes chromatically up to, uh, I haven't looked at it in a while, up to E, I believe. And, and it's, um, the format is, a, there's a fingering in the top left, about with two pages. With alto and tenor. With okay, alto and yeah, tenor, right, right, right. And then uh, uh, some technique, you know, mm -hmm. some just basic uh, uh, scale patterns and or arpeggios, mm -hmm. just getting function over mm -hmm. using the key. And then she goes into simple tunes. Right. Uh, folk tunes, uh, um, uh, symphonic, you know, examples, kind of things, um, but, but mostly tunes that you would recognize. Mm -hmm. And uh, you learn that key. Each, each uh, uh, key is, uh, or I keep, I'm saying key, but each note is uh, two pages mm -hmm. of instruction, and then you go to the next finger. Right. And, and that's what I mean is that in its simplicity, it's just... That's it's incredibly difficult yes. to make the notes sound good yeah. in Danny Boy yes. or Happy Birthday yeah. or whatever else yeah. is in the book. Exactly. Right. And so, again, probably one of the more important uh, altissimo study texts out there. I I really feel so. I really feel it's it's a wonderful uh, uh, addition to our uh, uh, pedagogical material. The other thing that I added to it that I always think is funny, um, I added uh, an appendix of um, extended scales mm -hmm. and then uh, just a sort of a technique thing, uh, example, in all, uh, again, in all keys. Mm -hmm. And then I ended um, with uh, the... Uh, is this the, the concertina? The bear, yeah. the last page. Of the, uh, the last the right, line of the first the page. page for, yeah. In every key. Right. And I figured if you could do that, you're good. You're good to go. Autismo <laughs> is done. You're, you're, you're a master. That's so funny. That's so funny. So there you go. Great. And so, because um, I need to pick up a copy, I still have my old university original. library. Yeah, original. Yeah. yeah. Um, what 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 is it published through? Who is it um, published through? Hickey's Music uh, Hickey's Ensemble. Music. Uh, I think it's Ensemble Publishers, but the easiest is Hickey's Music Hickey's in Music. Ithaca. You guys got to get a, you got to get on Amazon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, are you I think not, they are. are you? Okay. I think they are. I, I, I'm, and get I, the little prime next to it because, yeah. Oh, I should, I should <laughs> it's actually, a little hard I'll to follow, find. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. In fact, I just, I, I did a, uh, a panel discussion at NASA 
um, about pedagogy. Yeah. Uh, 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 that um, uh, we put together, and uh, it was. Oh, I'm going to forget names. I'm so bad. Sorry, people. Um, uh, uh, the saxophone professor from um, Schenectady mm -hmm. um, uh, Community College mm -hmm. and uh, Boston Conservatory and UMass mm -hmm. and myself and uh, all, it, it, the, the panel was all different uh, university settings, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's great. Um, anyway... Uh, we were talk the, the subject came up, and uh, this person brought up that he, he used uh, the line all the time, but it was unfortunate it was no longer published. <laughs> let, me, let me share. Yeah, this is yeah, important. So, <laughs> so internet land, internet. It's, it's republished, and there is more... Uh, readily available. Yeah, it's readily available, and there's more information yes. in there, and more exercises, and... It, right, and it's just continues this string, uh, this theme in your life of, yeah. of being a great teacher and, oh. and publishing things and making a, making it available. So, gosh, we're almost out of time. You Okay, so you, between the 104 students that you had in Texas and how many years have you been teaching at Susquehanna? And then there was a there was a Mississippi state. Mississippi state. There was Mississippi a Mississippi state. state in there. Great time. Okay, Great so time. you've seen you've seen hundreds, maybe thousands of students over uh, many many years of teaching. What what advice do you have for this generation to you know classical saxophone saxophone in general music teaching something to. That, that, that they, they can uh, take with them? Uh, um, be willing to get your hands dirty. Great. That would be my number one. Um, it What we do uh, uh, is not easy. Right. You know, but at the end of the day, what's fun about it is that we have to make it look easy. <laughs> Right, and um, so whether it's uh, performance um, and the, the time that you put in the practice room, right? Mm -hmm. You gotta be willing to do it. Um, uh, uh, whether it's teaching one-on-one uh, -on -one or uh, uh, it, with a band program, um, you have to be willing to put the the effort, the extra effort to, you know, you may have to say things to students a hundred different ways and on the 101st, they get it, you know, mm -hmm. but that's the reward, you know, right. and uh, uh, be willing to go in the library and sit on the floor and, and you know, reading all those instrumentalists and, <laughs> and uh, looking at those methods or, um, this might be surprising, but they're coming back. Uh, listening to the uh, uh, LPs right. that were um, available, you know? I mean, that's all part of what we do, you know? Having, um, having the passion and the interest in, in, our, in our art. Absolutely. And, you know, you definitely live your advice. You're one of the grittiest people I know. Uh, you're, you're definitely get things done and we... You know, a huge debt of gratitude. We owe you yeah. a huge debt of gratitude yeah. for this yeah. camp and for, you know, year after year having a wonderful experience here. And then I'm sure your students at Susquehanna would say the same thing. And so, again, thank you very much for joining me on the Saxophone the Performance the Podcast. The See how fast the an hour goes? It's amazing. We're done. That's amazing. Oh, thank you so much, Thank Gail. you, <laughs>